This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. everybody, happy Halloween. I have to explain the hat. Um, I think Pierre and I are both getting in a little bit of trouble tonight because we are not with our families trick-or-treating. And so when I told my daughter a month ago that I was not going to be able to trick-or-treat with her, it was, uh, it was a problem. Uh, Halloween's kind of a high holy day for her. Her birthday is the next day, so it's, it's a magical time. And so she's been bargaining with me about, you know, when I, I told her I needed to do this, she, was, she wanted to have me have a little bit of a punishment. And when she heard this was going to be on the internet, she said, well, Mom, you have to wear a costume. And I said, I, and I negotiated it through. We got it down to the hat, and we got it down to, I only have to wear the hat until it falls off, which, uh, given how I tend to gesture a lot during my talks, hopefully that will be very soon. <laughs> so that's my plan. Um, so that's my explanation for the hat. Anyway. Uh, this evening, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Knowledge Network. I know that's the, the, the uh, main focus of the, uh, the series. Um, and I think that I don't exactly know what you guys have heard before, but uh, I believe that this is something that you may be familiar with. The National Academy of Sciences uh, recommends that in, if we're going to actually start to treat people in a precise, personalized way, the Knowledge Network is a foundational tool that's going to help us to do that. And for those of you who haven't heard about this, I'm just going to run through really quickly what this is suggesting. Um, they're saying that if we take state-of-the-art information technology and allow it to put different levels of the person all together in one place, basically bringing all data together in one place, it's going to change research and it's going to change medicine. Uh, and the way that they're imagining this is going to happen is that these connections across information is going to help basic scientists to formulate and test disease mechanisms. And it's also going to help clinicians to develop new treatments and have them be specific to the person's metabolism and biology in front of them. Uh, and the, that's the good news. Now, the bad news is that uh, one of the co-chairs said that this is much like building the great cathedrals of Europe. One generation will start it, and another generation will finish it. It will be, you know, it will change many times along the way. This is a little discouraging for those of us who actually are trying to do this right now. But we at UCSF really think we've got to at least get started. You can't build the cathedral unless you start putting the foundation down and making the plans. And that's really at the, at the level where we are right now. We're, we're trying to build a roadmap for what this, what this should look like, how to really make it happen. And I'm going to take off my hat. Oops, it fell off, Laura. <laughs> and uh, so this is also a slide you may have seen. This is actually uh, from Keith Yamamoto. Uh, and this is suggesting that, that really there are many different pieces that come together uh, that, that are going to inform precision medicine. So basic discovery, omic medicine, uh, metabolomics, uh, genomics, those sorts of things. Um, a lot of computational uh, work. This is a the heavy data science sort of undertaking to put all this, uh, this data together. You've got to have heavy computation, infrastructure, and software. Digital health, which is like wearing biometric sensors and you know, basically taking data from all different aspects of your life and clinical discovery. And these things are all going to come together in an information commons, and that's going to translate into a more precise knowledge in the knowledge network, and that's going to affect both research and clinical work. So what I want to start with really is trying to make a distinction here, because I think this is, these are terms that people conflate a lot, and it actually is, they're, they're important to know the difference. And so, um, so to, to illustrate this, I have a little, uh, little story. Um, my, uh, my kids recently, uh, I, I decided, we decided together that we were going to get a fish tank. And this is the only, the first fish tank I've ever had in my adult life. So this is all new to me. We got some guppies. We got some tetras. We got some mollies. So uh, about four days after we got the tank, 
one of the Mollies was acting funny. And I don't know if you all know this, but uh, I didn't actually realize this. I started to do a little research about Mollies, and I found out that uh, Mollies actually, even though they're fish, give live birth. So you can actually have a Molly who's pregnant. And when the Molly was acting funny, sort of hanging out at the bottom of the tank, I was like, oh no, I gotta figure out if we're about to have fry uh, right now. And so I needed a little more information. I wanted to go online. I needed to figure out which gender these Mollies were. I had to figure out whether it was male or female. And you know, uh, that was, I didn't have a fish expert around. So what do you do when you need to know these sorts of uh, arcane pieces of information? You go to the internet to find out. So I went to the internet and I typed in Mollies. Um, and you know, you can imagine I got a lot of variable uh, very different information. Uh, first three entries, one of them was about fish, and the other two were about the fact that Molly's is a name for drugs on the street, and apparently it's two different classes of drugs. You can have, you know, Molly's can be considered MDMA or ecstasy, or it can be considered speed, apparently, from the first three um, aspects of, uh, of the internet. And if I, if I even look at just the fish sites, I get lots of different stories about how you're supposed to tell what gender a molly is. So you can imagine, there's a lot of different information. And, and the reality is I actually typed in sexing mollies, which you can imagine got me a whole world of things that you, I didn't really want my second grader looking over my shoulder while I was doing the search. But um, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing you get when you just look at the internet. Whereas, you know, of course, what do you do? In that situation, you go straight to Wikipedia, right? Like you sort of say, oh, I don't know which is right and what's wrong. Why don't I go to Wikipedia? This is not perfect. It's not got the every single bit of information about mollies, and some of the information may not be perfect either. It might not be entirely accurate. But we know that this is a this is a crowdsourced tool that lots of science, various experts get together and they. Uh, really check each other's work. They, you know, any, uh, one expert will read another expert's entry and challenge it and say, this needs some more background. This needs a little more information. You have to, you have to uh, explain why this, is, this assertion is here. And that process allows us to actually trust Wikipedia more uh, than just random searches on the internet. And the internet has the good information, but it m also has a lot of stuff that's not. And that's the way to think about the information commons and the Knowledge Network. Knowledge Network is like Wikipedia. It's a, a little bit more distilled uh, information that is a little more trustworthy. Uh, and the Information Commons is sort of everything else, uh, good and the bad together. So Information Commons can have, when you think about medical information, personal uh, biohealth information, some of the things that people have been proposing to put into the Information Commons are things like biometric data, like I was mentioning before. Um, maybe you have a Fitbit to you know, mark uh, your metabolism and how many steps you've taken. It's got a pedometry. Or it's got all these various different things you can carry around your smartphone, and it can take a lot of data about your diet, about your exercise routines, about your sleep habits. Uh, and that information has been proposed. Maybe that should go in the Information Commons. Um, people are also suggesting, hey, you know, maybe if we take the names out and take the identifying information out, maybe you're electronic medical record should go in the information commons, just the whole thing. Just put it all there. Let people do what they want with it and learn. Um, people are also, uh, basically people are thinking of the information commons as a place where there's not a lot of organization. It's a little bit the wild, wild west. You can put whatever data you want up there. Anyone can put data up there. Uh, and there's really no organization to it necessarily uh, because it's a, a self-organizing bottom-up tool. The other thing that's in there is everyone's opinions, just like the internet. Uh, everyone's opinions, everyone's interpretations, and the level of expertise of the individuals making the assertions and the level of accuracy of those assertions is unknown. You really don't know, just like the internet. And the other thing is there's no uh, way to manage the fact that identity makes a difference. In this mechanism, anonymity is likely okay, right? It's just information commons. It's sort of let's put everything somewhere. So in that case, the credibility of the information, the accountability to that information is suspect. We've all heard of situations where, say, um, on Yelp, a competitor will uh, put in bad reviews for somebody's restaurant because they want that restaurant to fail so that they succeed. And that's not a legitimate piece of information. It's actually antagonistic to the truth. So that's something that could happen in an information comment, supposedly. And this is, these are all kind of the imagined future. So the knowledge network, the idea of this is that it's an organized uh, ag aggregation of research quality data. 
uh, that really experts are contributing to, people that are professionals in whatever area are putting data in, into this. And it's usually summarized and organized in a way that the data actually makes sense to the other researchers and the other experts and scientists. Um, it may include key pieces of your medical record, really information that we think is, is actually important, that tells us something, that we've decided, hey, this is really, we need to know this. Um, and it, it's likely to be categorized and labeled. Um, we use different nomenclatures that, that link data together for something like this, because otherwise, researcher A and researcher B might be talking about the same thing, but they wouldn't be able to know it, and they wouldn't be able to share their data and make it one big data set. Um, so, so in this area, scientists' theories and their results, results that are maybe published in papers, uh, their interpretations of what's going on from an expert view are all part of the knowledge network here. And the level of expertise and the veracity of the information is actually quantifiable. It might not be perfect, just like Wikipedia. It might not be the actual perfect answer and, you know, end all questioning. But it's at least something that can be tested. And the other thing about this is there's really no room in the knowledge network for, for an anonymity. If you're going to make assertions and you're going to put data up there, you need to put your name on it and stand behind it. And that's actually part of the, the uh, security of a system like this is that you actually need to stand by what you've done and you can't put false information in or you'll get called out um, and people will marginalize you. It's very, it's, again, both are self-organizing and yet there's a little bit more structure to the knowledge network. So that's an important thing. Uh, because I think people conflate the two, and they're really, information commons can create information that goes into the knowledge network, uh, and knowledge network information can go back into the information commons, but they're really very different. So how is the knowledge network related to precision medicine? This is another thing that I get all the time. People sort of are like, well, you talk about them in the same sentence. A lot of people at UCSF uh, put them together, but why? And I think that, you know, if this, uh, if this graphic is sort of medicine as it is now, when in, in medicine we're often trying to answer questions. We're trying to understand the person, the patient in front of us. I say us because I'm a clinician, but, you know, any of us is also a patient. So we want our doctors to understand us, and we want them to understand us as well as they can and be as accurate as they can. The thing that makes medicine precise enough to be called precision medicine or personalized medicine is that we're trying to understand the person on all different levels. So rather than just interviewing me and finding out I have a headache and I didn't sleep well last night, you're also checking my genes and you're checking my blood levels of different, uh, different hormones and, and autoimmune factors and uh, various other aspects from top to bottom of all of me and putting it together to decide what's happening and to give me a treatment and a diagnosis. Now, in that kind of situation, what would we prefer? <laughs> would we prefer that information is coming from the information commons or from the knowledge network? I'll tell you, if it, were, if it were my child, I would definitely want to rely on the knowledge network. I'd want to put the best information together and have it be as organized and as, as verified as possible. And there's a lot of good information that could come from the information commons. This is a place where everybody would be saying, hey, this drug really works for me. And a lot of people are saying that drug works for them. Well, maybe that's something that researchers should actually take a good look at. And that's a good path of information. But just because something works isn't necessarily a reason to administer that drug. And the knowledge network would have the, the data to back it up. And so that's why I think that the knowledge network, while not necessary for precision, precision medicine, actually really helps us to, to meet the goal of seeing the patient on multiple levels. So now I'm going to talk for the rest of the time about what the roadmap to creating this knowledge network would be. Because again, this is still kind of imaginary. And we've got a lot of people and data and lots of things happening in the scientific world. And we want to put things together. But the reality is there's no such thing as the knowledge network yet. And yet we need to get there. So how? What do we need to actually do? What are practical steps? And so I, I want to pose this as really three challenges, three issues that we want to solve, that we're actively trying to solve here. Um, and the first one is really just about how do we get multiple data types together uh, and, and link them? And you know, this is something where for each of us in the reality of science nowadays, you get different silos that are maybe different labs, maybe different researchers are doing different things. But, but even if you just look at the data types, say there are four or five labs at UCSF that are doing or, or across institutions that are doing uh, neuroimaging. Uh, still, if you tried to link their neuroimaging data with another bunch of labs' genetic data, it's hard to do because when you look at the raw data, there's really no way to say this person's gene can be connected with this person's brain 
you actually have to do some processing of the brain and of the genetic, raw genetic data and summarize it before you can even cross the boundaries across the silos. And so we're working to do that and figure out ways where a neuroimaging expert can get a piece of data from a geneticist and say, oh, this is, this is a summary variable. I'm going to, you know, link it up with my, my neuroimaging and I'm going to get an answer. I don't need to understand, I don't need to go back to and get a PhD in genetics to understand the data. I can actually just take the summary variable the geneticist gave me. And that's the level that we're trying to bring data to. So each expert summarizes it and makes it more accessible to the other disciplines to facilitate linking. So one of the things that we're looking at really closely is the fact that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, obviously, in human biomedical science, we need to have a knowledge base. Well, are other people doing knowledge networks? Are other people doing knowledge bases? And it turns out that the Department of Energy has invested $50 million in a system that does this for plants and microbes. No humans, just plants and microbes. But there, it's a new system, and it's actually being uh, led by Adam Arkin, who's right across the bay at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Uh, and LBNL and, and UCSF are, are partners in a, in a number of things. And, and we feel like, hey, they've put a lot of time and effort into thinking through these issues, and maybe we can build on that. Uh, one of the things that's really nice about this system is that uh, they really have the idea that they, they want to put the data together and make the data mean something. It's not enough to just put a bunch of data together. There has to be interpretation. There has to be meaning that comes from it. And I think in, in a human setting with clinical situations and, and patients that need an answer, that's essential. We can't just have a big exercise of putting data together. It has to have a target. It has to have a goal. And the system is nice for that. So you'll hear me talk about K-Base every once in a while as I, as I describe what we're working on. So the nice thing is in a K-Base type model, they've already sort of figured this out. They, are, they have a lot of rules by which when you put data in, there are certain vocabularies that really help you to identify what you're putting into the system so that it can be linked. Uh, it also has uh, a lot of integrated analytics that I'm going to talk about, too. So it's not just about putting data in. There's more to it. And, uh, and it's a nice system. So I'll get into the details in a minute. But uh, one of the things that, that we're realizing we need to do to accomplish this is we need to think about what additional data elements do we need to put together? This has been built for you know, plants and microbes. So what are aspects of data that, that don't exist in plants and microbes? For instance, uh, brain imaging, <laughs> not something that exists in plants and, and microbes. And the amount of energy and effort we put into analyzing brains, uh, that kind of data has to, we have to have structures to contain that, you know, bins to contain that. And so we have to build those. Uh, the nice thing is that the fundamental levels of human biology are not siloed. They're not like, OK, well, this is the neurology part of human biology and the, and the cardiology part. When you're talking about genetics, when you're talking about having information out of libraries about um, human genomes, about uh, gene expression data, all that is really, it's one data type. And everybody can share it. So you do the work once to build the structures to bring data together, and then every discipline can benefit from it. So that's, it's worth the work that you put in the beginning. And so one of the things we're also thinking about is we've got a lot of databases out there. If any of you has ever done, if any of you is an informatics geek at all like me, and you've ever looked at um, PubMed and seen what kinds of resources are publicly available, uh, NIH has put a lot of money into making data available, information available, libraries on genes and on all different topics. And these libraries, could they be put together in one place so that they are actually informing each other and informing your data? Like if, you, if you're a research, you upload data from a patient, uh, from a clinical uh, patient or a clinical researcher uploading a clinical research set of patients. Could these libraries actually benefit the interpretation? And so what libraries would we want to link together and represent in a knowledge base? That's a question that we're actively working on. So another big piece of what the knowledge network is is getting people to talk to each other. I mean, that's a huge issue in science nowadays. We basically all have our own little thing that we're doing, and maybe we talk to some of the researchers on our block, and maybe we have a colleague at another institution, and, but really, we find out about the research once we read the paper, and maybe not even then. Maybe it's like two months later, oh, that came out in a paper? I didn't, I didn't see that. And that's not really the way that is going to move, the, the mechanism that's going to move science forward rapidly enough to cure the diseases we care about. So how do we improve the transfer of these, this procedural knowledge among researchers? What's going on, what research they're doing, how they're doing it? Um, and we want to do that on three different levels. 
So one level is just making people <laughs> be upfront about what they're doing. Uh, I think the model is everybody's got their lab notebook and they've got their, you know, they're in their lab and they're writing down their research process. Well, I put data set A together with data set B and you know, did this analytic on it and I use these, you know, parameters for my analytic and, and then maybe that shows up in the scientific paper, maybe it doesn't. And I think what the wave of the future is, is that scientists are going to have glass-walled labs. There's not going to be the chance to sequester your process anymore. You can't hide it because really, other scientists need to know. I need to know what data did you use and what quality it was the data and what did you use to analyze it? Did you use this parameter or that one? Because it makes a big difference. And so that kind of thing, especially in a high technology world, we actually need that information to even be a reviewer on a journal. You have to be able to understand what the person did to be able to say whether their results are valid or not. And so a system like this allows us to collaboratively work. There's a workspace there where we share and jointly edit documents. We share, we have scientific discussions. There's hypothesis generation where I say, I think we should do this, and somebody says, well, actually, here's a tweak on that that would make it even better. And that actually improves science, and we need a space to do that, and that could be in the knowledge network. And the other thing is that it allows researchers to audit, to reproduce, uh, and even improve upon the specific methods that one researcher did. Somebody else can come and, you know, build a better mousetrap on that basis. Uh, and it further breaks down silos. This is all very important. And it's happening. It's just not happening necessarily in one system. Uh, so the other thing is that we need to electronically represent the research process. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit more in more detail. One of the things that we think really would work well and that, that actually KBase has already done is allowing the analysis of the data to be part of the same system as the data itself. And the, the benefit of a system like this is that, you know, say this is the typical research process. You have a set of subjects, you have one data type and another data type, you're going to put them together, and you're going to use this method to get that result you know, a typical scientific process. Well, in a system that has integrated analytics and lots of data together and different kinds of analytics, here's what could happen. You know, the system notices you've got a data type X and a data type Y and it says, hey, you know what, you could actually, there's some, some other variables of this data type that you could also analyze. Uh, and you know what, there are these other subject sets that fit that same uh, parameter. So you're analyzing, you know, patients with neurodegenerative disease over here. You've got these Alzheimer's patients, but you know what? I've got I've got a set of uh, Parkinson's disease patients that you could also analyze. Um, and it, the system can also see the data types and say, you know what? You're using this method to analyze those data. Did you think about doing this method or this method to get some different kinds of answers out of it? Uh, and that actually can broaden uh, what you get as results. And a system like this would be very aware of what kind of method you're using. We we in in research, we're constantly, every couple months, we're upgrading our systems and our tools. You know, some, some hardware, some software gets changed. And, and we need to be able to keep track of that to know what the output uh, w means. And, uh, and this kind of system would actually track that. So uh, the other thing that's nice is this whole process just puts information back into the system, right? Once you run an analysis like this, you knew what data went in, and the system understood the data. It knew what kind, what the quality of the data was. It also knew the quality of the analytic and the maybe tolerance parameters of how strong or weak that analytic is, how precise it is. And it can actually take those results and weigh them based on all those factors. So it's all happening, and the researchers didn't have to do a lot of extra work. They're just in there doing their science but these things are now uh, represented in the knowledge network. So it simplifies matching of data with the appropriate analytic tools. It streamlines the iteration of the, a similar research process again and again by different researchers and, and uh, with different parameters. And it creates a permanent auditable record of the scientific process. This is all important, and we need to start to do this instead of having it be the wild, wild west, which it has been. So another aspect of this that's important is actually being able to communicate with other researchers and show them what you're doing. This is a mock-up of um, what uh, KBase calls the narrative. This is actually not an updated version of it. It's a much more pretty version now that they're coming out with just this month. But uh, it basically, you can see that what's happening is different researchers are sort of interacting. They're saying, hey, I, I did this analysis and I used these data sets. And there's a hyperlink to the data set. So if somebody wants to look at it, they can say, oh, yeah, I see that data. And another, another researcher says, hey, you, you missed a data set you could have used. And they say, oh, yeah, I could. I could use that. 
And meanwhile, since he specified these two data sets, there are like six or seven analytic mechanisms that pop up in the corner that say, hey, you could use these analytic mechanisms. And if we clicked on one of them, you get a nice output right in the window. And these are the kinds of things that, that are real and we'd like to do for, for human biomedical data as well. So the other piece of this is that it's not enough to put the data together and it's not enough to have some analysis happening in there we actually have to represent what the experts and what the people interacting with the system are thinking and what their results are. And so uh, right now existing systems are just really well-linked data sets, but to have a knowledge network, you actually have to do more. And to just uh, show you what I mean here, this would be the data that I represented before, all the different levels of data. But what if we represented what scientists think about the data? as part of what is there. So no longer do we have just the automatic, um, this data is linked to this because it's the same type and you know, sort of the, the obvious connections. Um, suddenly you have that you know, scientist C thought that their genetic data might link up with some metabolic data over in another silo and they did some research and found out, yes, it is true. These two things, these pieces of data really have a link and it's meaningful, there's a result there. And so to do this kind of thing, to, to have weightings for how data is understood in relation to other data, we actually have to do a lot of work with building analytics and al algorithms to, to figure it out. And this is, again, something that has been done, that the K-based folks and, and many others are working on, uh, determining how to, how to say something has a strong connection and, a, and is pretty certain uh, versus having a probability that's pretty low. Like somebody maybe said, uh, an expert said, I think these two things are related. I don't have any data to back that up, but I think they're related. That's a low probability assertion, but it should probably be there because they're an expert. They've been doing this for 40 years. They probably have a gut instinct that should be followed. Uh, but somebody needs to do some more research. Whereas another thing could be, have been replicated six times and that just keeps improving the strength so it's a more certain piece of knowledge. And that can all be explicitly represented so another challenge, and this is, this is actually where it gets fun for us scientists, because why build all this system? This is where the output happens. A system like this actually helps us do predictive modeling in our science. So predictive modeling means just being able to go into the computer, shift some things around, and have an aha moment to say, this is actually, I never would have thought of this, but maybe this over here is related to that over there. And I need to actually follow this up. Now that's where the really exciting medical science happens. So many of us have heard of these stories of, of someone having a, a eureka moment where something that didn't appear to be linked ended up being linked and something was cured. And that's the kind of thing that a system like this, if it's built right, can, can facilitate for everybody. Um, and so I want to talk about that a little bit. I mean, I, I think that I've made the point that we have terrible siloization, even within one discipline. I'm, I'm in the Department of Neurology, and I, literally we're in the same building now, which we didn't used to be, but now a, a number of us are in the same building. And if I walk down the hall and go from faculty office to faculty office, they don't know what the other ones are doing. They're working with different model organisms. They're doing different research. They see each other at parties and they're friends, but they don't actually know what the other ones are doing. And that's down the hall from each other. You can imagine if we look across buildings or across institutions or across the world, what's really happening. And that's the state of science nowadays. This actually needs to be changed. And uh, I'm gonna actually uh, talk about this a little bit more. If we, if we have a system that does this, we actually can do more predictive modeling. So in a system like this, the kinds of things that would be there the, the benefit that a scientist would gain from it is that they would be able to access all the data they need right there from everybody's silo, from everybody's lab, from everybody's uh, discipline. And it would be all put together. So, you know, the reality in biological research, it, even at a cellular level, we have people working on one little tiny piece of this their entire careers and their whole lab and you know 20 people are working on one little tiny piece and the experts learn what the other people are doing but it's a lot to keep track of and it's only the really good expert people that do keep it track of what everyone else is doing and that's not it's not required i mean it's it's important to do good science but it's not like anybody's policing uh, these researchers to make sure they're keeping track so putting all the information in one place. And this, the backbone would be just normal biology. Here's, here's what we know about how humans work. And then 
when people do additional experiments, say like, let's, what do we do when we treat um, this system with, uh, with this environment versus that environment, or we you know, model something, that's additional information that would go into the system. Uh, so lots of cell biology databases already do this, but the benefit of this is the unification into one place and being able to visualize it in one place. We humans, we have a hard time, you give us a big, you know, massive block of text explaining this, <laughs> it would be much, much more difficult than just looking at the picture and seeing the relationships among the, the various complex pieces. And so a knowledge network would have a lot of visualization to it, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. The other thing it would do is it informs research design. It helps us know what questions we should be asking. And that's a, that's a major job qualification for a scientist, is knowing what they need to ask and what they need to pursue. What's a valuable question versus a non-valuable question? And a system like this could help highlight that for folks. Um, this is a, a kind of a visual depiction of that. So I work with frontotemporal dementia patients. A knowledge network depiction of what we know about FTD could be these yellow bars. And so we have like kind of a cluster of knowledge over here in the system and a cluster of knowledge over there. Well, anyone looking at the system, even if they're not an expert, could say, what's the, there's no link between those two things. Or is there? Maybe that needs to be investigated. And so even junior researchers could actually have a better sense for where they need to target their research. Um, one of the things that, uh, that this, is, uh, this whole series is about is how the Knowledge Network helps us with precision medicine. And I want to, for the last part of my talk, kind of bring it back to that. Um, and I, I think that the contention is that if we have targeted very careful, precise cell biology investigations, that can lead to better precision medicine. But we really need to be integrated and have the clinical researchers integrated with the cell biologists more. A system like this can actually help with that. Typically, uh, at the precision medicine level, uh, we're kind of looking at, hey, I know that if their brain is shaped like this and they have this in their CSF and uh, we, we know they have this gene, then that tells us a lot about what their treatment response is going to be to, to X drug or to, uh, to some kind of intervention. And that's precision medicine. That happens in cancer beautifully. It's happening more and more in other disciplines. But the, the valuable thing really is to try to link it down to mechanism. Mechanism at the molecular layer, at the protein layer, at the genetic layer, thank you. Um, so that's really what we're going for is allowing the top parts of the patient to be linked all the way through the many different levels. And so just a, a real example from neurology about why this is really valuable and it affects how we treat patients. And I'm, I'm not going to get into the, the gory details of this, um, but I, this is really all the technical stuff is just to, to exemplify a point. Um, we see patients uh, in my group that are called semantic variant primary progressive aphasia. That was ju it's just a syndrome. It's just a, a bunch of symptoms together. It happens to be they don't. They stop understanding what words mean and what things are. Like you could put a key in their hand and they'd be like, what's this? I've never seen anything like this before. It's not a memory loss. It's a loss of knowledge. It's fascinating, but I won't get into the details. So we see these patients. And we've learned that most of these patients have something when they die, we look at their brains, they have something called TDP43 neuropathology in their brains. And a subset of these patients happen to have mutations in a gene called progranulin. So not all of them, but some of them. And that's what, you know, so that's where we're starting. We got data on the syndrome layer, data on the anatomic layer, data on the genetic layer about these folks. So the reality is, Bunches of researchers are looking at this problem and trying to say, how does the progranulin mutation, just the mutation, lead to the syndrome? That link is not obvious. And so you get, you get lab one working on it. They're using a, a mouse that has a genetic uh, change in the, in the mouse. Maybe it has a progranulin uh, knockout or knock-in. Um, then another lab is looking at stem cells and maybe neuron, uh, neurons derived from stem cells that have uh, and working on what happens when you fool around with progranulin with those. Another's working with worms, another's looking at humans, another's looking at a different kind of mouse. This is what the reality is. But these silos are kind of opaque to each other until they publish their data. So an example of that, okay, we got C. elegans, which is a, a worm model. And here's a researcher who, working with worms, basically decides, she, she looks at a system really carefully, she sees some, some hard data that uh, progranulin is related to stress res resistance in cells. It really, changing progranulin levels changes the speed with which cells are 
programmed to die. And that's a, that's a real basis. I mean, it's a, it seems like, wow, uh, this is a mechanism that causes cells to die. This could be it. This could be why these brain cells are dying. This could be why these patients have this disease, right? So she's really excited about it, and she keeps following that track. She's got a number of uh, next research steps. What's cleaving the program? And what's, what's the granulin receptor looking like? These are all important questions in that line of research, right? Here's another lab also looking at programmula, but they're looking at it from a whole different perspective. They're taking human plasma, and they're looking at plasma expression of various different proteins in patients with a programmula mutation versus those that don't. And they find that using a whole different set of methods, there's a whole immune system issue here where patients have different expression of proteins in, in their plasma levels that suggest that the proteins are being de dysregulated, there's an immune system dysfunction going on here, and that is actually what's causing brain problems. And they're going to, their next research steps are, let's try to induce these changes in mice, let's, you know, see if this is a pathway. These are, these are very different mechanisms. They both have factual basis, but what's really important here? The reality is that these researchers can continue down this line of research and be completely siloed from each other and not really take into consideration what the other labs are doing. And that's not going to solve the question. It's not going to get us an answer. And so here's a better picture. And this is actually my, my boss, um, the person who runs my group, uh, Dr. Bruce Miller, is a genius with getting researchers together and getting them to collaborate. And so he has a, he has a consortium that looks at this problem. He brings in researchers internationally. And they sit in a room together, and they all, they're all different levels, clinical researchers down to basic biology, and they talk about their findings to each other. And what ends up happening is, Everybody's got a different piece of the elephant here, and yet they're hearing it from each other and they're connecting. Now this uh, very real life way of putting data together has yielded some really amazing big picture information that all the researchers benefit from. So now here's the, here's the system, and we've got all the orange circles are different labs working on different parts of the system. And it's all being specified, and here it is all in one place. And the nice thing about that is, this actually affected how we view patients. So all this information that was going together and, um, you know, the cell biology was saying, well, there might be something happening with, auto with immune function. So a researcher, a clinician, clinical researcher in my group said, maybe we should go back to the patients and see if there's something funny happening with their immune system. These, these semantic variant PPA patients were just known as degenerative disease patients. But he went back and looked at their charts and found out that the SVPPA patients had a ton of other uh, autoimmune diseases. There, there's a whole inflammatory thing happening in these patients that we had never identified before, that we never knew was happening until we got connected in with the cell biology. And so this is actually something help, that would help us to diagnose these patients, might help with their treatment. This is a major finding. And so this is the way that cell biology can come back up and affect uh, our understanding of the patient. So, so this is a, an example. These are sort of, if we have different layers of the human and we're, we're asking questions, a system like this is going to help us to get these answers in a way that, that we typically don't get. So if I'm a neuropathologist and I'm asking the question, is frontotemporal dementia related to neuronal ceroid lipofusinosis? Um, there is nothing here that would link these. I can do research until I'm blue in the face and there's nothing on a neuropathological level that's going to link them. But in a system like this, what if I add these other layers? There is a link if I go down to the protein functions layer and come back up. There is a connection between these two that I wouldn't see unless I brought in the other data. And what if there are multiple connections, multiple paths? And a system like this could say, you know, this path is a little bit weaker than the other path. You know, if I'm going to put, you know, a grant into NIH and try to get money and, and put resources towards something, which one am I going to put resources toward. It's the one that is more likely to be the mechanism. Um, so another thing that we do all the time in my group is we see, we look at symptoms and try to guess pathology. For us, we're looking at patients with a neurodegenerative disease, and we can't know what they have until they die, basically, until there's an autopsy and we can see in, under a microscope in their brain what it is. We can't know. We look at their neurologic symptoms. We look at their neuroanatomy using MRI. We have some other biological things we look at, but we're always guessing at this layer. What if the system were able to help us make better guesses? 
saying, okay, this, this particular patient is more likely to have uh, FTLD TDP type A uh, than a tauopathy. You know, that's an important distinction for us clinically because these, these are actually drug targets. <laughs> we actually have clinical trials that affect this versus that, and they're completely different drugs, completely different mechanisms. So another thing that's important is determining which medications are going to be the best for a person. If we can do a map like this, we could say this is a worse metabolic fit than another one. And so that it will help us to, to mine the data to determine if our patient uh, in front of us has this, 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 and this factor, that's going to be a better fit for them. And, and we want to have a system that gives us that information. And so another aspect that's important is it's one thing to say, okay, I, I'm seeing that these factors are important. It's another thing to say, but what's the mechanism down low? Even lower than the genetics layer, we add the cellular and protein layers, we might understand why this is happening. And that will lead scientists to a cure much quicker than they happen to respond to this drug. I don't know why, but it works. We want to know why they respond to the drug and what's happening in their body. And that's going to lead us to cures. So to summarize, basically, a knowledge network is going to integrate three essential elements into one system. It's going to put the data together with the analytics, together with expert knowledge. And that's going to really facilitate, jumpstart the research process in such a way that it could actually directly benefit uh, clinical care. Putting data in one place, making it uh, visualizable, and uh, helping researchers to know what they should be asking and informing research design is really some of the, some of the things that the knowledge network would do that, that we don't have a mechanism for now and we need. Uh, and the, the good thing is that this kind of integrated understanding of human biology is really the scientific underpinning of precision medicine. Now, uh, Pierre is going to talk now and give you a very concrete example of how understanding the patient on many, an individual patient on many levels improves our ability to really know what's going on with them and give them the right treatment, the right care. So, so uh, yeah, thank you very much, Keith and, and Kate. Thank you. It was a great in introduction. So um, I'm actually uh, going to, uh, to do something uh, extremely dangerous. I'm going to do a live demo with an application that, that we have uh, running here on, the, on my iPad. Um, so, but before that, probably going to uh, show you a couple of pictures, just in maybe uh, uh, telling a couple of words about um, multiple sclerosis and, and really how this project um, uh, started. So, uh, really, the, um, I'm glad to say that you know, with uh, a lot of support from uh, you know, the NIH, UCSF, and many donors, uh, we've been able to develop this bioscreen as one of the um, first generation of really precision medicine tool that, that we are developing here at, at UCSF. And, and you know, in, in a few words, uh, the bioscreen is the way to put data in the hands of clinicians and patients and, and their family. And in, in order to promote a more accurate and, and a better shared uh, decision making, for very complex disease um, like like multiple sclerosis, so it's uh, it's all you know. Um, it's it's not really my work. It's really a, a great team effort from many PIs, a lot of people, and and the result of uh, 15 years of uh, leading uh, work in neuroscience. It's all from this building where uh, Kate and I are um, are very pleased to work uh, at Mission Bay. Um, the great campus at UCSF. Uh, I have a couple of people really working with me on, on a daily basis with this project and uh, also uh, really benefit from the insight of uh, many, many um, PIs um, at UCSF. So MS, multiple sclerosis, is a very, very interesting um, disease. It's, it's, it's a complex disease. It's a leading cause of disability in young adults. It's, um, it's affect about uh, half a million people in um, in, in the North America and about 2.1 million people worldwide. Um, usually, uh, a patient uh, will evolve over years. So um, within a matter of a couple of years, a patient can progress from a fully functional individual to a wheelchair with sensitive cognitive memory impairment uh, all along the course of the disease. Um, so what, what it really means for patients uh, is that um, the patient is absolutely um, in, is caught by the disease in the most predictive time of his life, 
Uh, it's, you know you're going to have to live with um, MS. There's no cure. There's a lot of treatments, but there's no re really no cures. Uh, we've made tremendous progress in the number of drugs that are uh, um, FDA approved. It's nine so far. We know it's going to be 15 very, very soon. But more importantly, we are absolutely in the dark about um, what is the most likely progression for, for a patient. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we call MS um, a, a complex disease because uh, we know it's, it's a, there's multiple factors that have a role to play uh, in, in having MS. It's an interplay of genetics. Our group has been really uh, uh, specialized in, in genetics for, for quite some time. There's an immunological manifestation. It's very complex. And, you know, as a geneticist slash statistician and bioinformatician, what I really, what I'm interested in is the variability of the disease over time and, and across patients. It's really difficult uh, to tackle that. So uh, it, would, it created really a, a, a problem. It's, um, the problem is to sh choose when to treat, how to treat, where are the options. Um, so um, the, the problem we're trying to solve is really finding the right treatment without a, a long and expensive trial and error process to find the right uh, uh, drug that we know work in general, but we want to find the one that works for that particular patient. Uh, so our, our goal is really, really to accelerate the path to find the right treatment uh, for each, each patient. Um, so to do that, um, again, I feel very, very fortunate to be, um, to be um, at UCSF. There was a good reason to, uh, uh, to leave France. Um, but um, we're really uh, building on 20 years of um, uh, great research on multiple sclerosis. And we've been, uh, in particular, leading this uh, cohort of not a great number of patients, only 600. But we've been, we're entering in the, ten, in the tenth year that we are following the first ones. So we have a window of data where we've been uh, looking at the patient. And we try to accumulate all the information, genetics, the uh, brain imaging, the clinic, the treatment, the env environmental exposure, so to really have the full picture um, about all these patients. And this is only possible in a place like UCSF because there's a lot of centers that are very good for one aspect of the disease. There are great colleagues willing to collaborate with us. But they, they, they don't really have uh, expert on MRIs that, like we have, expert in genetics. We actually have three different experts in genetics. Um, I'm being one of them specialized in one family of, of the genes, very interesting. But we need really to have all these people um, working together. Exactly like Kate described you, that this problem of siloed research Great people uh, accumulating a lot of data, but we want to accumulate and to integrate the, all these data about the same um, the same patients. So that's what we've been uh, really trying to do. So now for tenure we had the data, but how to make this data available, or to really benefit from all this effort, how to make the sum of all this great work and, and effort more than really the uh, individual sum of it. Um, so. To better introduce, um, you know, what we're doing, I was actually, I thought genetic was very, very inspirational about what we're doing. And um, I would just wanted to take a step back to tell you a little bit about how, uh, as a geneticist, I, I, I saw what was coming here and really uh, put all my energy into this personalized medicine project. In genetics, we've been, for the past 10 years, things have really changed a lot. Uh, what we've been doing and we're doing that more and more. We published a, a paper in Nature Genetics three weeks ago. Uh, um, you know, just to make a long story short, uh, for, a, for about 20 years, we knew only one gene associated with MS. In 2007, two genes. In 2010, 17. And as of last week, we are now at 110 genes. Mm -hmm. So it's an exponential uh, increment. How are we doing that? We're using technologies, we're using uh, automated uh, molecular biology. And essentially, what we've been doing for the past five years with a lot of success is we take thousands of patients, and the last, the last paper uh, we, uh, we published is 30,000 MS patients. And so you take a lot of people, and you take a, some of them have MS, you try to make sure that they have really a clinic well-defined uh, multiple sclerosis. And you take lots of controls, people that, who you're sure they don't have MS. And we're going to look at half a million of uh, position in the genome. And essentially what we're doing, we're doing a lot of statistics, and we're saying, okay, uh, 
in people that have multiple sclerosis, uh, we're sure that they have a little bit more of this genetic variant. Therefore, this gene has something to do with the fact you have the disease. Great, we found 110 of these genes, and that's extremely useful to understand how this disease is working, uh, what's, what's happening, and etc. So we're very happy to do that. We're doing that in, in a really worldwide collaborative effort. It, it takes a lot of energy to coordinate Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Harvard, UCSF, the French people, the Italians, the uh, Norwegian, etc. We have great meetings. Um, uh, so we are accumulating this knowledge and say, well, great. Now we have a lot of SNPs of genetic markers that are associated with this and, and say, well, that's great. I'm, I'm very smart. I can remember two genes, maybe 10. How can I remember 110? So, well, look, we have, a new, we have new problems. We need to find uh, ways to summarize that just because we can't remember that and say, well, wait a minute. Instead of looking at 1,000 people uh, with MS, 1,000 people without MS for uh, one gene and then do that a lot of time, why don't we do the opposite? We'll take one guy and know that we have all this knowledge. Let's look at all the genes that we d we've discovered. And we're going from a very population view, that's what we're doing classically, and we're actually going back to the individual. And so this paradigm is really, okay, we're going from, from the bedside, so yeah, we recruit the patients, we, we have them participating in, in, um, in these uh, research protocols, and we can't do anything without them. We do, we do that 30,000 times, so just imagine how much work it is in all these centers, and we're finding results publishing great papers. But we also have to come back to the individual level. So we start to do this kind of um, genetic profiling of MS patients, and I've been uh, working a lot on this thing for, for the past three years, where we do, okay, uh, great, we have lots of data, but let's, find, let's try to find an individual profile, genetically speaking, for each of these patients. So no, the problem remains the same. Some of patients that have MS, some of them, they have almost every single gene that we discovered so far. They're very genetically loaded with with, with grace. Other ones, they have nothing, or they, or they have as much or as many as people that do not have MS. So again, great variability. How are we going to use that? But this example was actually... Um, we learned a lot doing that. Say, okay, we, we do this loop from bed to the bench, the research, and then back. And that's how we're going to do it. And then I, you know, I talk to my MRI colleagues, uh, you know, the office next door, and say, hey, uh, we've done that in genetics. How that would apply to MRI? I say, oh, yeah, Pierre, you're right. Actually, we're doing great stuff in MRI, but ne the research stuff never goes back to the patient. Say, so, well, let's change that. Uh, let's work together. And that was actually a, a great project that we did um, uh, that was published a few months uh, a few months ago. So as you understand, it's a lot about um, lots of data that we have to um, to handle. And I just wanted to, uh, before doing the demo, um, try to give you a couple of definitions. And I apologize, I, I wanted to do that, and I forgot to uh, put that in the um, in the hands out. So. Uh, we're all talking about, uh, okay, precision medicine, etc. Usually we think a lot about precision or personalized medicine because of the genetics, because it's easy to think about a genetically informed uh, medicine where, okay, you have these genes, okay, you have this treatment. Uh, it's actually, we know it's, it's, it's only a partial answer, in particular for disease like multiple sclerosis. That would be too easy in a way, and it's, it's applying a lot f and very well for monogenic disease. One gene equals one phenotype, one disease. But for disease like MS, 110, and hopefully next year will be 200. Um, it's, 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 it's not enough. We keep working, but it's not enough. So what is personalized medicine beyond genetically informed medicine? It's a practice of medicine that is tailored to the specific characteristics of an individual patient. And we have to find out what are these characteristics that are important. Uh, many people and many of my friends here in the Silicon Valley uh, are talking about big data. And I actually, I stop using this word. I don't like it so much. Uh, in a way, it's, it's used in a very vague uh, way to say, well, okay, uh, there's an exponential growth of data uh, 
um, and availability of information that it, some of it is structured, some of it is unstructured, but there's a lot of things. And while we don't quite know how to process the data, and it's just we, we talk about big data when it's difficult for uh, anyone to process this information. Okay, great. So do we really have big data in, in, um, in complex diseases like multiple sclerosis? But that, again, that would apply to all the other diseases that... Um, we, we talk here in the Precision Medicine um, Initiative at UCSF. Um, frankly, the health data and the research data have always been difficult to integrate, just because they're siloed, they're very specialized. So it's not really big data, it's just the nature of the complexity of the data that has been difficult for, to integrate from the beginning. So not checked for this one. Um, do we have too much data? Uh, well, we certainly have too much to process. It's difficult to integrate, okay, but we actually should be very humble. Uh, I'm talking about a disease, multiple sclerosis, that will last at least 30, 35 years for all these patients. And even uh, working with the most advanced study, only have maximum 10 years of that history. So 10 years of, uh, I'm capturing 10 years of a disease that's going to last 35. No, I don't have the full picture. Certainly not. So it's not enough. So our, our data in health, even if we have a lot, even if we have all the genetics and et cetera, uh, if you think about MRI as uh, a way to uh, virtually cut the brain into 60,000 small cubes where we're going to uh, find stuff, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute, uh, that's not true. And plus the other thing is, it's, it's again, it's, 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 ter it's heterogeneous. It's variable. So the... the the phenotypes, the analysis that we're doing, we're dealing with extremely uh, variable disease. That's, that's usually not the case um, in any kind of other big data you can think of in marketing or advertising or whatever you want. So uh, we have to be aware that the big data we're talking about here in, in, in health is, is different. So what I'll do is I'll show you the uh, prototype that we've developed for uh, multiple sclerosis on the top of this data set that we had. And then I'll, I'll discuss a couple of uh, implication and, and perspective. So let's let's uh, let's adopt the, the patient point of view. What we want to do uh, is to give a 360 degree view of 100 data points per per patient. What it means for um, a patient like Anne here is that we want to show clinical data. So clinical data are typically collected uh, with with clinician. But there's also a lot of um, for neuro inflammatory and neurodegenerative disease like MS. It's a lot of matter of function. How do we capture this kind of information? There's a lot of genetics. Genetics is very dear to my heart. We, we need to show that also in a very easy way. Um, we have new ways of imaging the, the disease and the process. It's brain imaging, it's spinal cord imaging, it's eye imaging, very important. It's treatment. Obviously, treatment are really Im Im important. They are complex. They are lasting in time. Patient not taking it. Uh, their size effect very important. And there's also environment. Uh, think that you know smoking is typically uh, one exposure factor, but there's a lot of uh, other things, in particular in MS. So what we want to know is, given all these pieces of information, all these pieces of the puzzle, how is her MS progressing? So let's try to show you that uh, with a real example and should be able to do that correctly. And so what we've been doing, okay, uh, right. So um, all the names of the patients here are, are, are fake. So uh, we're taking very seriously the um, protection of health information. All the application is secured, password, encryption, etc. But I'll... For, for the sake of the demonstration, I'll, I'll use the um, uh, anonymous way to show the, uh, the information. And so we have all our, all our patients are actually stored in a database in the cloud. We, we're using a lot of the cloud-based technologies um, to make all this information available. So all the patients that are in this uh, research cohort are here in my database. Uh, I can look them up by characteristics, by names, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll just, you know, going to take a patient and see um, uh, what we can say about this patient. So uh, we're, getting, we're getting the data for that patient and say, okay, um, there's a couple of different kind of images that we're looking for um, uh, for this patient. There's information from the clinic and there's clinical score that reflect the functional disability of the patient. So we can actually follow the uh, trajectory uh, of that patient over time. 
lots of information about treatments, biomarkers, including genetics, uh, imaging information that we are computing from the uh, images and the images themselves. Um, if you think about it, uh, even in uh, one of the best hospitals in, in the United States uh, and one of the best department of neurology, the way we are looking at these data uh, in our clinic is actually in a pile of papers that looks very much like an old phone book. Um, you know, this is insane. When you think about, uh, when I see myself transferring money using my iPhone, there must be ways to do that uh, in, in, in a better way. And that's essentially what has been the, the driver of, um, of, of this work. So uh, I, I can touch the, uh, one of these area, and that will take me to uh, more data that I, that I, can, that I can do. Once again, this, this core name, uh, EDSS for uh, disease severity scales, uh, is a score that we're using to globally assess how severe the, the disease is. It's a score that really measure functional disability. Uh, pretty much six, the patient is in a wheelchair and then working with a cane and et cetera. So essentially, the higher the worst. So right away, we can see how this patient is doing over time. Great. Since everything is electronically available, why don't we add more information? And I want to see treatments. What So she had... Uh, one treatment during this period of time, et cetera, very good. And multiple sclerosis is a disease that um, evolved by um, attacks. Uh, so this is very, for a few days, patient will feel very bad. The very important event that we want to also show, see over time. So these are represented by these orange triangles and we can get some more information about it. So great, so now, right here on my iPad, uh, in a secure way through the Wi-Fi, I can get all, all this information for that one patient, and that's already extremely useful. Uh, it's really changing the way we're showing uh, data to patients. Um, so uh, you can you can see it in here, and okay, uh, you can accumulate and overlay different kind of information. Great. Uh, frankly, I think that's what every hospital should be already doing, and you should have access to that. Uh, from home, prepare the visit if you have questions and etc. What was really important and what was really uh, the cornerstone of what we've been doing in this project, say, okay, now um, how are we gonna inform and better understand how she's really doing? Okay, we know she's doing, uh, she was here and then up and then pretty stable and that goes on over time. Okay, good. Um, and I have two kids and they're also uh, collecting uh, as, uh, candies during uh, Halloween. And uh, if you remember, when, when you're taking your, your kids to the pediatrician, uh, well, you're gonna wait your baby, right? And the pediatrician, we're gonna say, we're gonna use growth curve to tell you, well, uh, okay, your little daughter is in the bottom 20% of the American girls. Uh, you have to feed her. She's in the bottom 20%. Uh, or in the case of my boy, well, your boy is in the top 2%. Uh, maybe you should slow down on the snacks and, and, and candies and etc. cetera. Uh, and so, well, that's great. We should, that's, that's a very good idea. That's, uh, isn't that so much different from, from the pediatrician just saying, hey, your uh, boy is a little bit too big, uh, uh, say, or your daughter, she's, well, she's petite, huh? mm, you, should, you should feed her. No, 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 you should quantify the information. We have all this information. You know, all these babies are weight and et cetera. That's how you build the growth curves. So. Why don't we do that for any kind of information that we collect for a patient? And uh, bring that to the actual point of care and, and build our own reference curves given the data we have. Uh, that's exactly what I just did by uh, pressing here on, on the reference population. And so now we can actually uh, see how she's doing compared to 275 patients that I have in my database. And I can see that, so this orange line here represents the median line, so 50% of, of the reference patient uh, over here and 50% below, and 75% here, 25% here. So she is basically now evolving in the top 25% of the most severe patient. That's a very important piece of information. Uh, uh, it's not just an opinion saying that she is not doing that well. It's actually a quantification compared to other patients. Uh, and that's actually uh, a very 
data-driven supportive evidence to explain why we put her right away on a second-line therapy. Um, so another dimension of that, and since everything is available electronically, you say, well, you know, think back again about uh, your kids. Say, well, maybe your reference curve is not is not the right one for for, for my kid. It's not that big. Uh, well, what, you sh what we should be able to provide is a way to say, well, okay, uh, let's see if your reference curve is, is the right one. Well, uh, in m many of the autoimmune disease are actually a little bit more prevalent in females. And for some reason, you could say, well, uh, this patient is a female. I don't want to compare, to compare her to male and female. Great. Let's switch off the male. Reset the population and see if anything going to change for that patient. Answer is no. Obviously, you have a little less number of patients to compare to, and you can do that for many other things, age, treatment, uh, type of disease, types of treatments, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really uh, trying to feed the intuition of the clinician with, data, with pieces of data that are actually way easier to, um, uh, way easier to use. Uh, I, I'm not going to show that to you, but we have another function here that says extrapolate the next data point. Um, I want to be extremely cautious about these things. It's, it's working quite well. Uh, and it really, we really implement that here as a, as a concept um, more than really some, an algorithm we want to, uh, to test and, and show. But my team is working very hard on new ways to do that. But essentially, if, we do, if we're able to take one patient at one time point and say, and look at how she's doing compared to people at the same period of time in the disease. One thing we can do is say, well, good. You, uh, let's see how many patients I have in my database that were like you, but two years ago. Because I have some information about, the, about them for the next two years that you're going to go through. And maybe I can use this information to anticipate uh, what are the treatment that might work for you, or uh, what are your chance to go to a wheelchair uh, or maybe what worked for these other patients. So when you start to, to think about that, um, it's really a paradigm shift in the way you use the data. Even if we had clinic access to individual clinical data, what you're going to say is actually I use the individual clinical data. We know that on average the drug is working well. What we don't know, because it's 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 different level of granularity, is what are the patients for for whom the drug worked absolutely great. We can mine the data with, with, with tools like that. So we're doing that for uh, many pieces of, of data. Uh, EDSS is an interesting example because neurologists know quite well about it. It's used in every single clinical trial. That's usually why I showed it first. But there's many other pieces of information that, that, we, can, uh, that we can show. Um, and, and some of them are actually very new, and there's no time for the neurologist and general uh, neurologist uh, um, uh, to a, a greater extent to learn about new metrics. Uh, this is a new metrics. This is, uh, we all, including myself, are losing brain volume over time. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. What we know, it's, it's a little bit quicker in patients with very active disease like multiple sclerosis. So what we're showing here is the annual decay uh, of the brain volume. So uh, at that time point, typically, she is losing 1% of, of, um, of her brain. Great. Uh, and I did the test a month ago with the new resident in neurology. I said, OK, good. You're a very good neurologist. Congratulations. You're welcome at UCSF. So what you, you know about brain atrophy and these complex disease, but you probably don't have a, a good quantified sense of the phenomenon. And I said, OK. So 1% uh, a year, I showed this exact same patient and said, uh, is that a lot? Is that, what do you think? So, well, no, uh, Dr. Kuo, we don't know. We, we're not expert like yourself. I said, no, no, I'm not expert. Uh, what's important is that we should give you access to the data. And bam, right away, you can actually interpret how she's doing in terms of brain volume decay uh, over time. So she's actually not doing very well. Um, she's, a, she's a very severe patient. And you can also try to interpret uh, how this curve is, is evolving um, at, in coextensively with, um, uh, with the ATEX. So we're doing that for, um, again, many metrics, including those that are computed directly from brain imaging, from 
uh, eye imaging and, and, and stuff like that. Um, what is also very important um, is, in a way, data is just data, and tools like that actually can blur the, the actual frontier between what is FDA-approved clinical data that you have access to in the clinic, maybe, and research information. So, well, data is just data. Let's just make it available. Um, so typically here, we are, uh, we've been um, looking at all the genes we knew a year ago, 62, for each of these patients. And some of them, we try to represent what we know as a pie chart here, and with the size of the pies, um, um, of each pieces of, of the cake here proportional to the actual risk that one genetic variant is bringing. So we're bringing that here, and we also that have the scores um, so that we can appreciate, again, in comparison with other patients. Uh, so we have this number that summarize how much this patient is loaded compared to other patients. And here we, can, we, we see that only 20% of the patients have higher uh, genetic load compared to her. And centric, you can change the population if you want to, and et cetera, and et cetera. But again, the idea here is to say, well, we have information, we have the most up-to-date data that we have for each single patient must be available. Um, and then we said, well, that's great, but it's, you know, one, it's, we're just dealing with numbers over time, et cetera. Could we extend the concept to more complex kind of images. And again, I have very good relation with our MRI team and uh, Dr. Ron Henry uh, here at UCSF has been doing a great job compiling all the MRI data that we have for the patient and say, well, you know, it's great, but um, the actual life of um, MRI images is to go to radiologist and he write a report and that's sent to the neurologist and maybe the neurologist will uh, have access to the MRI or the patient will bring one CD for, that's, no, CD-ROMs are so uh, 20th century. Uh, <laughs> we don't want you to do that. So I say, you know, why don't we take all this information, store that in a cloud? Again, we have a secure server. Uh, it's all encrypted. It's de-identified so that uh, we, we, again, take the, the, the privacy of the patient very seriously and say, OK, great. Uh, so just think about a pile of CDs how long it would take to load into six computers and start to compare them. Forget it, you, won't, you will never do that. Um, and so we put that in the cloud, we store that and say, well, yeah, it's easy to look at. And we really want to have access to the information and not only in two dimensions as we usually look at them, but maybe in three dimensions so we can actually move the cuts in the brain from front to the back, from the top to the bottom and from right to left. Oh. So when we do that, we have done a three-dimension navigation tool. Why stop at three dimension? We actually can do four dimension um, adding time. So for the demo, I'll, we can also show different type of images. And I know she has a, a, um, a large lesion in the brain, so I'm going to try to use that. And I'll try to show how this lesion has been evolving over time. So we're going to move here. Uh, so you can see this piece in here. That's, uh, that's a lesion. So that's a region where um, the disease is actually uh, think that something is wrong, and it's destroying the uh, insulation around the neurons and the axons, so the communication doesn't work properly anymore. Uh, we know that because we can, again, bring a lot of information to um, uh, on the top of the row data, the row images. So typically here, I'm, I'm going to bring, if it works, I'm going to bring uh, colors. And the, the, um, if it's blue and if it's go to the red and the purple, that's mean that you have a lot of this insulation that's very good for your neurons. And you can see in the lesion here, uh, the, we, the myelin sheet, as we call that, is actually, is actually gone. Um, so now we're looking at that region. I'll change the contrast to make it easier to see. So we are looking at that lesion that was last year. So we are looking at one slice of brain two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago disappeared, and six years ago was not there. 
So the idea is really to use all these technologies to make the data available. Um, and we can even animate that, just having a little movie where we, we're looking at how it works. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do to make that even better, but the current way we are looking at images is very difficult to really access the information like that. Uh, there's plenty of things we can do, and what uh, we are working now on is actually uh, really uh, implementing the comparison of one lesion to a reference population. And what uh, we're doing uh, is actually taking a lesion here, so that's approximately here in the brain, and say, well, okay, you have a lesion here in your brain, good. Um, how can we help interpreting how severe it, uh, it, this is? So we can actually look in the exact same position in the brain of all other patients and see if this is common to find a lesion in here. And maybe even say, well, this is absolutely not common in multiple sclerosis, maybe something else, or maybe we have a subtype of disease. And what we're doing is, so we're gonna bring colors in here and say, okay, if it's blue, it's very uh, infrequent. If it's red, it's typical from, from the disease. And again, for us, precision medicine or personalized medicine is using all the patient data that we accumulated to bring some more better interpretation, population driven, for one particular patient. Um, I'm going into, so I should hurry up a little bit. Um, so maybe. Uh, I'll go back. So we have that for that patient and and, um, and many other. Let me go back to uh, uh, my slides and I'll be happy to take a lot of questions. Uh, so essentially it, it has uh, three steps. The first one is we are great, we aggregating all types of um, patient data into a single view. So everything Exactly like what Kate described to you, we try to do we try to do that uh, for just one disease. Uh, once you have that, you really want to gain access to data that is usually not that accessible at the point of care. Typically, what we're doing with um, with imaging, uh, and when you are able to do that, it's a great. No, what I want, what I really want to do is compare an individual patient to a tailor group that really corresponds to the same characteristic and use that to make a decision to better explain what's going on for that patient and actually to use some data-driven evidence to uh, make sure that we are doing the right thing for that, for that patient. So by doing that, we're really taking a path where we first need to access the data, describe it, uh, compare it, and then we can start to think about being uh, predictive and maybe eventually pre prescriptive. Maybe we'll be able to develop algorithm that will say, well, recommendation number one for this patient based on the data, you even don't need to look at it, but uh, recommendation number one is keep on the same treatment. Recommendation number two is maybe you can take this supplement. Uh, it seems that it works pretty well in other patients. And that's, that's the place actually not to finish the, um, the visit, but actually that's the place to start. And your neurologist will say, oh great, I have the computer recommendation based on all this data. No, let's make sure that the computer is right. Uh, and let's see if that's really what we, we need for you. But that's really where uh, we're trying to, um, to go. So uh, maybe to, um, to open the, um, um, to start opening the discussion, and uh, because I'm French, I love talking, and uh, it would be even better with a glass of wine. But there's there's a lot of um, question we we may ask when we're doing that. So we're really passionate about that, uh, about the way we're trying to create this personalized medicine tool. But um, there's maybe there's a lot of things that are a little bit puzzling. Uh, if you think about it. Um, we're talking about personalized medicine, but all what I've been doing is actually going from a patient to a population and actually more going to the population level because that's what is really bringing some uh, meaningful information. So in a way, um, the nature of personalized medicine, the way we do it based on uh, population data, appears somewhat to be self-contradictory because all we need the common to actually define the personal. So, it's, so that's um, kind of a funny thing that I'll be happy to comment more on. Um, it's actually also question the, uh, the categories we're using all the time. Uh, medicine is very good at making categories, uh, but in particular for diseases like, like uh, multiple sclerosis, 
uh, you know, what really matters is how things are changing over time. So your category is not really relevant because everything is changing over time. So rather than uh, thinking about categories, substances, maybe we should think about individuals as a process. Uh, so the personal is actually the trajectory. The path is more important than really um, the guy we would be looking at one time point. Uh, so that's, um, that's an interesting point of view about what does really personalize men. Um, Lots of people are talking about empowerment based on, on data, um, and, and it has a lot of implication in science policy, but uh, it's interesting to see what's really the normative framework that is created by all these data-driven interactions. So it's really bringing the power of the quantified information. Uh, is that for the good of the patients? Uh, is that for the good of the clinician as well? Uh, how are we doing that? I usually say as a joke that uh, my son, who is uh, three years old, um, in 20 years from now, I, I bet he would not accept that a physician take a decision without any pieces of data-driven information like we do here. Um, and, and that's probably very, uh, very interesting. Um, so we're also uh, thinking that, uh, and we got a great uh, support from the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Initiative um, um, that was recently funded by, uh, by the Congress, uh, it's application like that. Are they really trying to center the care on patients? Are we really trying to bring the information to patients so that for, the, for their own good, so that they can better understand and actually make decisions? They say, well, I have choice between two different treatments, and maybe I want to know which one are pills, which one are injection. That's really what matters the most to me. So again, that's uh, an interesting piece of, of, of information. What I like about the um, this this uh, project is it's also, um, we're putting a lot of effort uh, in that. Um, and it's really um, promotes really health as the most important value in our life. Uh, and sometimes it seems that we're using that to say, well, hey, um, it's because health is so important that we need to aggregate all the data. Uh, and there's a lot of issues about uh, how we're using this, this idea that health is so important that we should actually have access to all information that is available. And if, if, your, if your credit history is important for your health, maybe we should also accept your credit history data. So that raises uh, a number of, um, of concerns. Um, and again, that's also uh, changing, I think, the way um, we are thinking about similarities between individuals. So uh, as a geneticist, uh, genetic was very funny, and there was a lot of um, mythology about genetics in, Typically what I am, I mean, my genes, what do we have in common? We have genes in common, great. Uh, but here we are also redefining actions uh, and behaviors based on what biological characteristics or what our disease characteristics are in between different patients. So great, uh, great question that I think we should uh, take very, um, very, very seriously. So as a conclusion, these, this first generation of precision medicine tools really address the challenge of dynamic management of complex chronic disease like multiple sclerosis. The concept would apply very well to other disease. Uh, pick your favorite, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, SLE, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also uh, showing how the interaction of physician and patient with such tool uh, will change the way uh, potentially we, we practice medicine. Um, the three uh, key steps that's maybe uh, which you may remember from, from the little demo, is you want to access the data, you want to see it. Uh, you want to contextualize, I'm not sure it's the best word we could find, but it's really uh, understanding the data. And we want to use an actionable interpretation so that we can use the data to support decision making. Uh, so it's, this project is great. We had nothing just two years ago. Uh, it's really a great way to support um, and, and stimulate all the research we've been doing on, on all these different angles of, of the disease, but it really um, requires a lot of studies to validate what we're actually, actually doing, work more on the algorithm, and et cetera. Um, it's really, I don't have all the 50 something people that have been working with me on that, but some of them are here, in particular, uh, uh, Professor Steve Hazer, uh, here with the chairman of neurology at UCSF is really be uh, supportive from day one when I say, oh yeah, give me that project. I love it. I think we're gonna do something great. Say, oh, 
hey, you're crazy, but uh, okay, do it. Um, and, and a lot of people will come in. Thank you very much for, uh, for your attention.